blessed Lord's Day to each and everyone. Welcome to our online worship. It's a joy and privilege to be with you today. And as we come together as one family and one church, let us prepare our hearts to worship our Lord. And let us read this Psalm, Psalm 92, as we reflect and prepare our hearts. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. Senseless people do not know, fools do not understand, that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evil, evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are forever exalted. Let us praise our God. <laughs>
turning over tables and calling for return to our lives upon the altar things we did at first you're clearing out the temple you're cleaning out the dirt for we are your territory lord we are your church we are your people you are our god we are your temple make us holy like you to please you where only you can see for every moment matters in eternity we are your people you are our God we are your temple make us holy like you are we are your children, you set us apart. God, for your glory, make us holy like you are. You are 
We are continuing our studies in the book of Romans entitled God's Righteousness and we are now in chapter 12. But before we continue, let us review. Here in chapter 12 verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. In chapter 12 verse 1, Paul sums up all the previous 11 chapters of Romans as the mercies of God. And what are the mercies of God? In Romans 1 to 11, Paul tells us these things. And here's the summary of that. These are the mercies of God. Because of sin, what we deserve is God's wrath and condemnation. But by God's grace and mercy, he justified us. He made us righteous through faith in Christ. And at present, God is working to sanctify us, and that is to make us more and more like Christ. And in the future, God will perfect or complete his salvation. He will save us once and for all, and that is the glorification of our bodies. And that is God's plan and perfect will for us. Now from chapters 12 to 15, Paul will answer this question. In view of God's mercy, then how should we live? In view of the blessing that we receive from Christ, how then should we respond? In the view of the undeserving grace that we receive through Christ's love for us, how then should we live our lives? And the answer, God calls us to live out his righteousness, and to reflect Christ-like behavior in our daily lives. And that includes the various relationships that we have. And here is how Paul outlines the next chapters from chapters 12 um, to 15. God calls us to live out his righteousness and reflect Christ-like behavior, first towards God, then towards fellow Christians, then towards others in general, and even towards enemies, and then towards civil authorities, then towards everybody, and towards the weak, and strong. Now let's go to our text in Romans 12 verses 9 to 21 and the title of our passage is Sincere Love. Sincere Love. And as we go through our text today, think about how our, how our Lord Jesus Christ modeled these virtues of sincere love towards us. Think about how our Lord God, Christ Jesus, lived out this sincere love during his time here on earth and showed us how to live for God. Allow me to read this passage to you, but I'll be using a more literal translation. Romans 12, 9, 21. Love without hypocrisy, abhorring the evil, cleaving to the good, in the love of brethren, to one another, kindly affectioned, in the honor going before one another, in the diligence, not slothful, in the spirit, fervent, the Lord serving, in the hope, rejoicing, in the tribulation, enduring, in the prayer, persevering to the necessities of the saints communicating, the hospitality pursuing. Bless those persecuting you. Bless and curse not to rejoice with the rejoicing and to weep with the weeping. On the same mind one toward another, not minding the high things, but with the lowly going along. Become not wise in your own conceit. Giving back to no one, evil for evil, providing right things before all men. If possible, so far as in you, with all men, being in peace, not avenging yourselves, beloved, but give place to the wrath, for it has been written, Vengeance is mine, I will recompense again, says the Lord. If then your enemy does hunger, feed him. If he does thirst, give him drink. For this doing, coals of fire you shall heap upon his head. Be not overcome by the evil, but overcome in the good the evil. 
This passage is a long one and it's composed of 13 verses. And in these verses, Paul gives us about 25 commands and exhortation. And some Bible scholars says that this passage in Romans chapter 12 is the love chapter of the book of Romans, similar to that of 1 Corinthians 13. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us that love is patient and kind and so on and so forth. And now Paul does the same thing here in Romans 12 verses 9 to 21. Paul shows us different aspects or different virtues of love, and he shows us what biblical love looks like. Now, here's the main point of our message for today. Sincere love is living out God's righteousness and reflecting Christ-like behavior in our daily lives. Sincere love is living out God's righteousness and reflecting Christ-like behavior in our daily lives. And we can divide this passage into four categories. First, it's sincere love defined, and then sincere love towards our fellow Christians, and then towards others in general, and then towards our enemies. Now, take, take a look at each of these, starting number one. In verse 9, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy, or love must be sincere. In the original Greek, the opening sentence has no verb, and so the literal translation reads, Love without hypocrisy, or love sincere. This phrase basically serves as the title or the theme that heads this list and it, it will define what will follow. No? How do we define sincere love? Sincere love is first and foremost real. Sincere love is real. The word love here in Greek means the word agape, which is God's kind of love. And the first time that Paul used this term agape love is found in Romans chapter 5, 5 to 8. It says, and hope does not disappoint because the love, the agape love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God demonstrates his own love, his agape love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Paul tells us that God loves us while we were still sinners, while we were still undeserving, while we were God's enemies, Christ died and sacrificed his love for us. For what reason? So that we can receive God's love and forgiveness. So God gave us the Holy Spirit also and adopted us into his family. That is God's agape love. You see, worldly love focus on the self, but God's agape love focus on others. Worldly love, it's about getting, but God's agape love, it's about giving. God's agape love is self-giving, self-denying, and self-sacrificing. It is a love that extends grace and mercy to those who are undeserving. And dear church, God calls us to live out that same kind of love. Now, Paul urges us to live this kind of love towards others. And so here it says, love must be sincere. Let love be without hypocrisy. Love must be real. You see, in the, the hypocrite is a Greek term for a stage actor. In ancient times, in ancient uh, Greece, the actors would usually wear different masks to play different characters and roles. The actors would then memorize lines, they would emote their feelings, they would control their voice and act on certain behaviors, and they would control their body language to play a character. But when the show is over, they would remove their masks, they would go back to their own place, and they would just be who they are in their real life. And so Paul draws on this illustration and says, love cannot be like that. You cannot put on a show. You cannot put on a mask. You cannot show love in a different way towards others and then do other things when they are not looking. Paul says, sincere love is not hypocrite. Love is without a mask. Sincere biblical love is not fake. It is authentic and genuine. In Tagalog, we have this term, hindi plastic. You see, we can develop a culture of niceness in church. We may smile at people, say hi, and be polite, and appear to be warm from the outside. But then we can also even compliment them. But in reality, we may despise them inside and gossip about them behind their backs. Dear church, this should not be because God calls us to be real in our love. So may God help us. Let us look inwardly and check if our lives are truly honest before God. And if there's any sense of hypocrisy in us, then we should repent of our sins and come before the Lord, ask for forgiveness, and starting today, live out that love that is real, that is genuine. And so, let us do our best when we 
meet our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let us be genuine and truly ask and, and, and mean when we ask, how are you doing? Or, or if we say, I'll be praying for you. Let's do that. Let us not just say that just for the sake of feeling good or, feeling, uh, or, or being kind in appearance. But let us really be praying for those whom we said that we will be prayed for. Again, sincere love is real. Next, sincere love is committed to the good of others. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Hatred of evil is the other side of love. It may seem strange that right after Paul talks about love, he, the first word that he uses is abhor, which is a strong word, which means intense hatred. In Greek, the word for Evil is poneros, which is the strongest word for evil. And then the Christian response is to be equally strong. We are to detest evil. We are to hate it intensely. Paul says we, are not, we should not just dislike evil, but we are to utterly hate it and utterly reject it. Why? Because God hates evil. Evil is directly against God's holiness and God's goodness. Evil and wickedness also bring harm and hurt to others. And thus, evil is the enemy of God. Evil is the enemy of love. But here is our problem. Our modern society is systematically molding our minds to, and our hearts to tolerate and accept evil. For example, the evil of sexual immorality. Most of the movies available today celebrate sex outside marriage. And the result, we no longer hate evil. Well, actually, we are already desensitized from evil. And instead of hating it, we are actually entertained by it. Evil is no longer something that repels us. Instead, evil has become fun and entertaining. So we have to be careful. And so let us examine our lives and see if we are truly hating evil or loving it. May all of us come before the Lord and just ask him for, for his help. Lord, Help us, help me to really hate evil as you hate it and help me to love what is good. Again, this calls for us to renew our mind and to, to seek God and, and follow his standards and his way. Now, verse 9 tells us that sincere love has two sides, a negative side and a positive side. Not only God calls us to intensely hate evil, but God also calls us to cling to what is good. The word cling means to cleave or to be glued. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, God wants us to bind ourselves or to glue ourselves to what is good. And what is that good? Philippians 4 8 tells us, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is according to God's standard, the truth, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure or lovely or admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Again, the point is sincere love hates what is evil and loves what is good. Next, Paul tells us or shows us various ways how to sincerely love our fellow believers. And that is from verses 10 to 13. And this is the first. Let us love them like family. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Here, Paul uses the words that speak of a love of a family for each other. Be devoted is the word philostorgos in Greek, which means a love of a parent towards a child. And brotherly love is Philadelphia, which refers to love between siblings. And here's the point. God calls us to love our fellow believers with the same love and commitment that we have for our family. It's loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's committing ourselves to them through thick and thin. It's loving each other like family and not giving up on them. CBCP is a disciple-making church, and one of our core values is family-oriented. And as a church, we don't want to only deepen our relationship with our own family members and limited to our biological family, but we want to deepen our relationship and intimacy with our spiritual family, and that is our brothers and sisters in the Lord here in this church. And I praise God that I see this sincere love in our church. I see some of you giving our fellow members a uh, ride home, going to church or, or, or going home from this place. I see you sending food to our sick members or praying for them or helping them in their financial needs. I see you sharing your blessing and inviting others to celebrate with you for God's goodness in your life. I see you praying for each other and encouraging one another. And as a church, may all of us continue to do this more and more by God's grace and so that we may honor God and we may be a witness to the world around us. Next is honor them. Let's honor our 
brothers and sisters in the Lord. The word honor means to treat someone or something as valuable or precious. It is to esteem, to respect, and show genuine appreciation to someone. You see, every person is created in God's image. And when that person turns to Christ, that person now has the Holy Spirit inside his or her. And therefore, God calls us to honor that person because when we honor each other, we also honor Christ. And notice how the ESV translate this verse. Outdo one another in showing honor. Did you hear that? It says outdo one another. It says compete in showing honor to each other. It's like you need to compete so that you can be the first one to show honor to the other person. And again, showing honor should be real. It should not be fake. But as we honor each other, we should be careful also because partly we want to outdo each other, but not necessarily honoring each other. But what we want is somehow we want to outdo each other, but then we want to come up on top. We want to be the one to gain honor. But Paul tells us this should not be. Outdo one another in showing honor, but don't compete so that you would be the one to gain honor. You see, Paul tells us sincere love is something that is not self-oriented. Sincere love is not self-oriented, but it is others-oriented. It is actively putting others first. It is giving preference to fellow believers. And I praise God that our church, we have people who are doing their best to honor others. Just look around you. And, and if you are regularly attending the church, sometimes you would experience a... Um, a smooth worship uh, service. It is because of the people serving behind the scenes. It is because these people chose to honor you so that you can have a wonderful worship experience. But for them, they are doing their best and they, they sacrifice their time. They, they come here earlier so that they can prepare everything. And so at this point, I'd like to honor those people behind the scenes. And I'd like to appreciate you for all your hard work and effort. I would like to honor and appreciate our staff, our, our leaders, and our volunteers, to our ushers team, to our parking volunteers, to our worship team or tech team or the kids ministry team. And for many of you who are working behind the scenes, you go here to DC every week. You arrive at least one hour before so that you can prepare and serve our CBCP family. Thank you for your love and effort and sacrifice. And may the Lord establish the work of your hands. And to our life group leaders, our journey group leaders, to our fellowship leaders, thank you for your effort and sacrifice throughout the week. Thank you for leading our discipleship groups. Thank you for helping our members grow to know God, to love people and make disciples. And may the Lord reward you for your faithfulness. Dear brothers and sisters, may we do our best to honor one another. And maybe later after the service or during the week, find a specific person who, whom you know is a volunteer. Approach that person and, and just say, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for, uh, for serving the Lord and serving us. And let's show appreciation and honor one another. The next is serve them. Let us serve them. In diligence, not slothful. In the spirit, fervent. The Lord serving in the hope, rejoicing, in tribulation, enduring, in the prayer, persevering. Another way to show sincere love towards our fellow Christians is to serve them. Again, to serve is to focus on others instead of self. And serving requires diligence. The word diligence here means to act with haste, eagerness, and enthusiasm. And here's the point. God calls us to serve God's people with eagerness, with excitement. And not only that, sincere love serves with fervency. And what's the difference? Diligence pertains mainly to action. Being fervent in spirit pertains to attitude. The word fervent means to boil or to bubble with heat. And the idea here is to be on fire in serving God and serving others. Now here's the problem. Serving and loving other Christian is hard and messy. Discipleship is hard and messy. As we love and as we serve others, we will experience disappointments. We will experience hurt and frustration. We will get tired. And perhaps some of you are in that place right now. You're pouring out your time and energy to disciple someone. But it seems like that person is not growing. And not only that, perhaps that person did or said something that hurt you. And so maybe you have lost your fire for God. You are discouraged and you feel disappointed and you wanted to quit. Now, if you are in that place right now, then this is God's word for you. 
serve the Lord diligently, serve others fervently. As the Apostle Paul says, keep your passion burning, keep the fire burning. Don't give up, but fan into flame that desire to serve the Lord and his people. And how do you do that? Verse 12 tells us, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Friends, as we serve God and others, we will face difficulties and disappointments. And to overcome that, we need to constantly remind ourselves of our hope in God. And what is that hope? The Bible gives us several facets of this hope. So let me show you some of those. This is our hope in the Lord. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. He who began a good work in you and the God who is working in the life of the people that you are leading will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus our Lord. And our Father who sees what is done in secret will reward us. And our present suffering is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us in Christ Jesus. And Christ our Lord is coming soon and he will reward and give to each one according to what he has done. Dear church, this is the hope that we have in the Lord. And so let us anchor our souls in this hope so that we can have the patience and the strength to endure, to keep on loving God, to keep on serving his people, to keep on loving the family of God. And here's the key. To have this hope, we need to be faithful and persistent in prayer. Why? Because you see, prayer focuses our eyes on God instead of our difficulties. When we pray, it renews our perspective. Prayer reminds us that God is greater than our difficulties, than our problems and disappointments. And when we pray, God's Spirit empowers us to continue with our God-given mission. When we have that renewed perspective, renewed mind, it will inspire us to move forward again. It will give us a second wind so that we can run again. So dear church, let us be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Now another way to show sincere love to our fellow Christians is to share with them, share with them. Verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Sincere love shares. Love is not a sentimental emotion that you feel, but it is a willful action that you do. And contributing or sharing is a concrete expression of this sincere love. The word contribute or share comes from the Greek word koinonia, which means communion or fellowship. You see, in the eyes of society, we rightfully own things, but before the Lord, we really own nothing. We are just stewards of what God has blessed us with. And as God's stewards, our most important responsibility is using our personal resources to contribute to the needs of the saints, to contribute to the needs of our our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus made this clear in the parable of the Good Samaritan that we have the responsibility to help anyone in need. But we also have a greater responsibility to serve our fellow believers. As Galatians 6 tells us, Therefore, whenever we had the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith, especially to those in the family of God. Now, connected to this responsibility is practicing hospitality. The Greek word for practice here means to press or pursue, and the Greek word for hospitality means kindness to strangers. In other words, we are to actively look for opportunities to help. And the picture here is someone intentionally running after a person so that we can meet that person's need. Now, interestingly, this command to show hospitality is repeated several times in the New Testament. And church leaders are called to set an example by their own hospitality. And this is one qualification for an elder, as Titus 1.8 tells us. Elders are to be responsible, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled. You see, during the time of Jesus and Paul, There were no nice hotels, and the places to stay were either dangerous or expensive. So the Christians traveling around to spread the gospel relied heavily on the hospitality and kindness of other believers. Now, how does practicing hospitality apply to us today? For one, each of us can practice hospitality by welcoming newcomers in our church. How? Look for that person sitting quietly in the corner. After the service, don't rush at the door. Just Stay and just hang out and we invite you to to greet people and let's invite others to have coffee and snack and let's connect with each other. For those of you watching online, I encourage you, come to church, join us in person and meet other people. Let us welcome each other. And another thing, invite new people to be part of your life groups. Invite people to be part of your journey groups and introduce them to your group members and warmly welcome them. 
Dear Church, let us be hospitable to one another. And what would happen when we show sincere love to our fellow believers? What would happen if we show that we love each other like family when we honor and serve one another and serve each other? Jesus said, this is what will happen. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is our witness to the world when we love one another. So may the Lord help us. Next, Paul tells us various ways how to show sincere love to others in general in verses 14 to 16. The first is to bless others. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. This passage is closely related to what Jesus commanded in the Gospels in Luke chapter 6. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. The point is, God showed his kindness towards us, his enemies, and we are to show the same kindness to those who hurt us. And we will look more into this as we go to verses 17 to 21. The next is empathize with others. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You see, sincere love is willing to get emotionally involved. It is not surprising that a lot of people are going through pain and suffering, especially during this time of pandemic. Some people have lost their health. Some people have lost their loved ones. Some people have lost their finances. And some people have experienced other losses in their lives. And it is during this time of pain and sorrow that God calls us to reach out to others so that we can carry each other's burden. And you know, God calls us just to be with the people, cry with them, weep with them, and help carry their burdens. Recently, a, f a friend of mine lost his loved one and my wife and I visited him. We did not say much to, that, uh, to him, but we just sat there and, and just listened and cried. He, he's a guy and, and he said he needs to be strong for his family, but then we just encouraged him, just cry and we just want to listen to you and cry with you and, and praise God after that time of of meeting, of carrying his burden and encouraging him, we see that afterwards his face um, turned better and there's a, some, a sense of joy. Of course, there's pain, but also this sense of uh, being lightened in his countenance. So praise God. And God calls us to do the same, to cry with those who cry and carry each other's burden. On the other hand, God also calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice. Now, here is something I realize. Sometimes it's harder to rejoice with others than to cry with them. Why? Because sometimes we have envy and discontent in our hearts. For example, we cannot really celebrate with people whom God has blessed with, but we ourselves, we think that we are not blessed. For example, a friend gets a promotion at work and you're struggling financially. Perhaps you, your friend closed a very good business deal, but you are struggling in your business. What would you feel and how would you, what would you do? Perhaps you'll tell them with a big smile, praise God for that, but deep inside, you're not entirely happy about it. But if you're in that situation, we have to be careful because sincere love is not fake. God calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice. Now, if there's envy or jealousy in your heart, we need to ask the Lord to help us deal with that concern. Ask the Lord to help you to be genuinely happy with the blessings that others receive and for you to be content with your specific situation because God is working in your life, which you may not understand right now. Ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to give you joy despite your circumstance. Ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Next, be humble with others. Verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Here, Paul addresses the need for right thinking when it comes to our relationships. Notice what he says. Don't be haughty, arrogant in your thinking. Don't think you are so wise. What's the point? Paul urges us not to be conceited, but to be humble and to be lowly. Why? Because in reality, we have nothing to boast about. Remember, we are all sinners and there is nothing that we deserve except God's punishment. Instead, God loved us. He did not reject us, but instead he accepted us and made a way so that we could come before the Lord so that he could accept us. He sacrificed Christ on our behalf so that God can accept us. 
We're in that lowly position of sinfulness, but Christ died on our behalf. Now God saved us and elevated us in that high position to be part of his family. And knowing that, it should not stir pride in our hearts, but instead it should humble us. And that is something that we need to be reminded of. And that is what Paul is urging us to do. We need to show humility, reminding us of the undeserved grace that we receive. Now, showing humility is shown by associating with people of lowly position. Because remember, this is what God did with us. We were lowly, rejected, good for nothing. We are sinful in our ways. So all we just deserve is punishment. But God, from his high position, he came down and associated with us. And the, in the same way, God calls us to do the same. We should associate with people of low position. It could be someone of lower financial class or social status. Or it could be someone outside your normal circle of friends. The point is, do not be snobbish. Don't be conceited. But be willing to associate with people of different class and social status. Just as Christ humbled himself to show his love towards us, God calls us to do the same to others. Now here's the next area where we can show sincere love towards our enemies. Verse 17 to 21. Who are our enemies? It could be the unbelieving world around us. It could be those outside the church. But our enemy can also be those people who were close with, but then somehow in some way they have hurt us. It could be a family or a, a friend who have hurt us and given us pain. Now Paul is writing to the believers in Rome. At that time, Rome was becoming a hostile place for believers. And so now, the question is, how can we show sincere love for those who are unloving towards us? How do you sin show sincere love to those who are causing you pain and hurt? And here is what Paul says. Number one, be at peace with them. Verse 17 to 18. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of man, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Be at peace with all men. In the Gospels, Jesus commanded his followers to be peacemakers, and that is to maintain peace. We are to maintain peace for the sake of our Lord. Not only that, Christ also urges us not only to be peacekeepers, but also to be peacemakers, and that is to initiate or promote peace. As Matthew 5, 9 tells us, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So dear brothers and sisters, when we pursue peace, we reflect the character of our Father in heaven. So let us be the one to seek peace and promote peace. Now notice what Paul mentioned here. He said, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. You see, sometimes reconciliation won't happen despite our best effort. Nonetheless, here is something important. As far as it depends on you, as far as you do your best, seek peace. So dear friends, reflect on these things. Is there someone in your life that God is asking you to be at peace with? Perhaps while you are listening to this message, there is someone that God is bringing into mind. Just write the, the name of that person uh, somewhere or remember that person and after the service, after this message, initiate and take that first step towards reconciliation. Pray for that person. Pray that God would prepare his or her heart and after this message, call that person or send him a message. Be the first one to reach out. And as you take that step, pray for the Holy Spirit to empower you. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is also peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Now, if the person is not yet ready, if the person is not yet ready to be reconciled, then it's okay. What's important is that you did your part, that you took the first step, and that you are seeking peace. And because of that, God is honored and glorified. So may the Lord help us. Next, how else do we show sincere love towards our enemies? Verses 14, 17 to 21. Don't retaliate. Don't retaliate. Bless and do not curse. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Never take your own revenge. Do not be overcome by evil. Notice the four negative commands that Paul gives. Do not curse. Never pay back evil for evil. Never take your own revenge. Do not be overcome by evil. In other words, sincere love does not retaliate. Why? The following verse tells us, it is because we are God's beloved. Verse 19, never take your own revenge, beloved. Before we came to Christ, you and I were rebels and sinners. We were God's enemies and none of us deserved God's love. But what did God do? 
God's love was extended to us. He showed mercy to us. And God wants us to extend that same kind of love towards our enemies. And when we do that, we imitate and we reflect Christ's character in our lives. Let us remember, we are undeserving, but God loved us so much. We are God's beloved. So dear beloved, whenever you are being tempted to retaliate, don't avenge yourself. Don't take revenge. Because here is another reason. God is our avenger. God is our avenger. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. See, Paul tells us that vengeance is God's department. It is his responsibility. Now think about it. What happens when you take revenge for yourself? What normally happens, most likely, you will mess it up. It will be either you will be too harsh or too soft. It will be too early or too late. But most likely, you will take revenge in a wrong way. And so Paul urges us to leave room for God's wrath. Leave room for the wrath. Why? Because vengeance belongs to the Lord. There will be the right time and right place for God to execute his perfect justice and vengeance against the wicked. Now here's the principle that we need to learn. What we know impacts how we live. What we know impacts how we live. You see, if we know and we are certain that God will deal with the wicked, we don't have to worry. We don't have to take matters into our own hands. And if we are sure that God will eventually judge the wicked and punish the evil, we can let go and just surrender to the Lord our desire for revenge. Now you may ask, how about the abusive, the murderers, and the lawbreakers? Should we just ignore them and tolerate their wickedness? The answer is no. You see, as individuals, none of us are qualified to render punishment to those who offend us. Again, let me repeat that. As individuals, none of us are qualified and have the right to render punishment to those who offend us. But God has appointed his governing authorities to deal with those who do wrong. And that is what we will learn as we go towards Romans chapter 13. But eventually, the point is, we need to make sure that we surrender vengeance to the Lord because it is him who only has the right to take vengeance. Now the point is, vengeance executed by the wrong person is wrong. Vengeance executed by the wrong person is wrong. Therefore, let us not retaliate. Now in the end, taking or not taking vengeance is an act of faith. In the end, not taking vengeance is an act of faith. We are called to surrender our will to God. And we are called to trust God's perfect wisdom and timing because eventually he will punish the wicked and reward the righteous. And as we wait for that time, what are we supposed to do? Verse 20 to 21 tells us, we are to overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a difficult passage to obey. You see, it's one thing not to retaliate, not to do anything when people harm you. Just sit there and quietly. But it's a completely different thing to do something good to those who are hurting you. But Paul says it clear here, overcome evil with good. And he quotes actually from Proverbs 25, which says, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. You see, I remember one time, meron akong sinisingil, no, may utang, and ayaw niya magbayad. And ito yung matindi, sabi niya, I'm a Christian, he's very proud, he's a Christian. But whenever I go to him, he doesn't want to pay his debts. It was really difficult because this person promises to pay, but on certain dates, when I go to him, he will, he will tell me, oh, I cannot pay, next time again, next time again. But you know what? By God's grace, God gave me a heart to pray for him. And I actually told him, you know, I know you have also financial difficulty, but you have this responsibility. But I'm also praying for you. I pray that God will bless you so that you can pay your debts. You see, it's very difficult to bless others and to be kind to others, especially when they are hurting you. But by God's grace, I was able to experience um, God's empowerment to help me to be patient with this person and to even speak gently with this person, even though that this person is not is doing not, uh, something that is not good. Now, how about you? Who are your enemies? Who are the people that have hurt you? Perhaps there are people who have scammed you. 
recently I've heard of many people are were victimized by online scam. It's very sad. And perhaps you or perhaps your trusted friend betrayed you, or perhaps someone you love so dearly hurt you so much and gave you pain. Whoever it is, God calls you to love your enemies. And not only that, but to to show love in a concrete way by doing good to them, by praying for them, by, by blessing them. This is a high calling and on our own, we cannot do it. We need God's spirit to empower us. But then what happens when we do good to our enemy? It says we will heap burning coals on his head. What does it mean? You see, in ancient Egypt, there's a custom where an, a person would carry a on his head, a pan of burning coals as a sign of repentance for his sin. It's the person's way of saying, I feel so much shame and guilt for the sins I have committed. And that is what Paul says here. When we show kindness to our enemies, our good action towards our enemies could perhaps convict them of their sins and bring them to repentance. And what else would happen when we do good to our enemies? Proverbs 25, 22 tells us, and the Lord will reward you. And the Lord will reward you. You see, that is the promise of God. When we show kindness to our enemies, he will reward us. Either he will reward us with material blessings or with something else. The point is, God will reward every kind and good deed that you do, especially towards your enemies, because you are reflecting his character. And so that should motivate us to overcome evil with good. Remember, God is watching and God sees everything that we do, especially if we do it for his glory. Now, as we close, let me ask you these questions. Are you overwhelmed by the things that we've covered? It's a long list. It's a long message. I am overwhelmed, but I pray that all of us would take time to review and once more listen to this topic and just um, reflect on the things that we need to learn and what to apply in our lives. But more than that, I encourage you to evaluate your life. Is there an area of your life wherein you failed to obey um, based on this uh, express, expressing sincere love? Ask the Lord for help. Is there an area of your life that you have been faithful? Then praise God and thank him for enabling you. But for all of us, let us remember this lesson that we have today. Sincere love is living out God's righteousness and reflecting Christ likeness or Christ like behavior in our lives. Sincere love is living out God's righteousness and reflecting Christ like behavior in our lives. Finally, reflect on these things. What aspects of sincere love are you already showing in your life? What aspects of sincere love do you need to start doing? What aspects of sincere love do you need to keep on growing? Is it in being genuine and real? Is it in intensely hating evil or clinging to what is good? Is it in loving fellow believers like family? Is it honoring your brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it in serving them and sharing with others? And what else? Is it showing sincere love to others in blessing them, empathizing with them? showing humility and associating with the lowly. Or perhaps it's showing sincere love towards your enemies, being at peace with your enemies, not retaliating and overcoming evil with good. May all of us as God's church, as God's family, live a life of sincere love. Sincere love is living out God's righteousness and reflecting Christ-like behavior in our daily lives. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and love. Thank you for reminding us that we are undeserving of your love, that we are rebels and sinners, that all we deserve is your punishment. But Lord, out of your great mercy and love, you send your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you so much for this undeserved mercy and grace. Help us not to forget these things, but may these things motivate us, Lord, to live out sincere love towards others from this day forward. Help us, Lord God, to live a kind of love that is real, that is honest, that, that honors you, that loves others, that blesses others. Help us, Lord God, to reflect on the things that we've learned today and to apply these things in our life, in our walk, as we live this out, as we apply this in our family, in our workplace, in the community we are in, in the church, and even towards our enemies. May you help us to be Christ-like 
in our thoughts, our minds, our words, our actions, our love. May you grant us, Holy Spirit, your power. Help us to live a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Father, in everything, may you alone be glorified and honored in our lives. Thank you, Lord. And as you bow your heads, let me give you this benediction. May our Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his mercy and peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Thank you once more for joining us. May God bless us all. See you again next time.